as we continue in our study. All right. James chapter 3, verses uh, 6 through 12. And we're talking about something that most everyone has, and that's a tongue. And as you think about that tongue, think about how much trouble that tongue can actually get you into. And if you have a what we call a silver tongue, sometimes it'll get you out of trouble. Now think about that. I want you to also think that the tongue doesn't control us, really, or does it? Because sometimes we, th we say things and we put ourselves in a bind, and it begins to control how we react. So with that thought, let's look at this word, beginning with verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. A world of iniquity. The tongue is set so among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeded blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or grapevine, bear figs? Thus no spring can yield both salt water and fresh. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're breaking open your word tonight. And Lord, the, the subject that's in your word is one that's dear to all of us. It is something we all face. It is something that can either cause us very much damage or something that we can use to help people. And so, Father, tonight, give us insight into how we are to use our tongue. Give us understanding of what the problems that are that come with the use of the tongue when it's uncontrolled. Father, bless our time of study. Thank you for the grace and blessings of life that you send us. Thank you, Father. Bless your word. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So, when is the last time, and I want you to see the slide that's on the screen, when is the last time you lied? Well, preacher, you're getting kind of personal. Yeah. Uh, your relationship with God is personal, right? This is God's word. And so he wants a very personal relationship with you, and the best way to get that is for you to answer the questions in your mind. Don't tell me or tell the rest of the congregation the last time you lied, but think about the last time that you lied. When was the last time you spoke in anger? I mean, we never get upset, do we? we Ms. Miller, we never get upset, do we? We don't, we don't speak in anger. We're Christian people. We love the Lord. So we're not going to lie and we're not going to speak in anger. When is the last time you said something hurtful? Well, preacher, we're Christian. We wouldn't say anything that would be hurtful toward someone else, would we? Think about it. And let me just be honest with you, we do. And there are actions in our lives that also are hurtful to fellow Christians. So when you look at that, that screen and you see these things that are written up there, answer them to yourself. When is the last time you lied? When is the last time you spoke in anger? And when is the last time that you said something hurtful 
about someone because this is real life. This is who we are. You know, last time we talked about a little bit about biblical knowledge and controlling the tongue, and we went through some illustrations. And these illustrations were basically a, a bit in a horse's mouth. And uh, you remember I talked to Keith a little bit about trying to control that horse with that bit and, and that Mexican bit that would pinch the tongue. And, 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 of course, he was right. You know, it controls most horses, but there's always those wild horses that you can't ride. It wouldn't control. And guess what? That's the same way with us. There are some people that a, a bit in their mouth would not control their conversation. Also, the second illustration that we talked about was a rudder on a ship and how that small rudder would change the direction of a ship, controlled that ship. And so we begin to see that the tongue controls the good and the bad. The tongue controls whether or not we are good people or whether or not we are actually bad people. The tongue reflects who we are, but it also gets us in much, much trouble. Have you ever spoke some words that as soon as they left your mouth, you wish you had not spoken those words? That begins to control your life. So your tongue has control of whether you're a good person or a bad person. Now, we're going to the, the first point tonight on the slide, and I want you to see Number one, the tongue out of control, and that's found in actually beginning in verse 5 and goes to verse 6. Notice with me, beginning at the end of verse 5, it says, See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And so here is this, this idea of a fire, and this fire is out of control. I had two twin brothers, they're younger than I, and we were kids. Uh, they were about 11 years old, and, and, you know, back in my day, when you were 11 years old, you have a shotgun in your hand, and we raised uh, rabbit dogs back then. There wasn't a lot of deer around Yazoo County, and we lived on the farm, and we would go rabbit hunting, and the neighbors back then, because you didn't have a lot of deer everywhere, they didn't matter. It didn't matter to them if, if uh, we hunted on their property. It didn't matter to us if they hunted on our property. And so my two little brothers and two of his friends took our rabbit dogs and went across the highway, Highway 16, we live on the 16 highway, over to our neighbor's pasture, and they were rabbit hunting. Well, they were young, but one of the boys, he decided he wanted to smoke some cigarettes. That's bad, okay? No matter how old you are, that's bad. And so they lit cigarettes and they threw the match into some sage grass and it caught on fire and it began to burn off a 40 acre field they had the forestry department and the fire department all the neighbors and my mom and they put out the fire and the only thing and it wasn't one of my brothers praise God he's still living my mama didn't have to kill him. But one of our brother's little brother's friends is the one that did it. And so he was very apologetic. But I remember the boy saying, I just threw that match down. We walked a little ways and looked back, and the fire was so big we couldn't put it out. It is a fire out of control. That's what we need to apply to the issue of the tongue. We don't mean for it to get away. We don't mean for it to cause problems, but sometimes we let our tongue get out of control. And that small fire begins to become a forest fire, and it just continues to build. And, and with the, the modern age of technology that we have and the cameras that we have and the satellite TV uh, and, and the way they're able to broadcast from on site, we in our generations have been able to watch them fight fires on the news and how they'll load up airplanes full of water and they'll put out chemicals that will supposedly uh, cut the oxygen off to the fires to try to control these huge fires. But people lose their lives because these fires are out of control. They cannot control the fire. 
That's what happens when we let our tongue get out of control. I want you to see some verses with me tonight that deal with a little of this. And so we're going to start first with Psalms verse 83. And we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. If you have your Bible, mark your spot and turn with me to Psalms, to the 83rd Psalms. In verses 13 and 14. In verse 13 of Psalm 83, the psalmist writes, O my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind. As the fire burns the wood, the woods, and as the flame sets the mountains on fire. You see, it starts off with a small fire. It goes from the trees, and the next thing you look, and the whole mountain is on fire. And that's exactly what happens in our land today, in California especially. And that is what happens. It is a, it is a analogy of what happens with our tongue as we let it get out of control, and the fire continues to burn. Go with me to Proverbs, if you will, in Proverbs 15. I'll give you a moment to turn there. We want to look at these verses together tonight, if we can, Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15 and verse 28, Solomon writes, The heart of the righteous studies how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. When you break that verse down and you look at the end of the verse and that word pours forth, it is a flood. It is a word that would be used to describe water that's coming over a levee or a dam. It is, it is so much water that it cannot be controlled and it's causing enormous amounts of damage. Go with me to Proverbs 26 and verse 20. Proverbs 26, 20. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no talebearer, strife ceases. And so here is Solomon, a man of great wisdom, and he makes a, a tremendous statement that if you've been around the campfire... I remember going camping when I was a little man, and we had a tent, a little two-man pump tent, and we'd cap out in the pasture, and we'd carry wood over to the middle of the pasture because we had a pond that had fish in it, and we would catch brim. And we would fry those brim, and we would carry wood. Well, no matter how warm you think it is when nightfall comes, if you don't have a fire, it begins to get cold. And I have woke up in the middle of the night, the fire had gone out, there's no more wood, and we're cold. The key here is the wood, when it runs out, there's no fire. You take the wood away from the fire, and the fire begins to diminish. It begins to leave to the point, finally, it will go out. And that's what the psalmist is writing about. And here is this fire, there's no wood, so it is dying. But notice the last part of the verse, and where there is no gossip or talebearer, when there is no one gossiping, strife ceases. And what, what the Solomon is writing about is once we control our tongue and keep it under control, there will cease to be strife. But if we let it control us and let it get out of hand, then we will always have this problem. Do you know words hurt? I remember as a kid, y'all remember the little saying? Sticks and stones. Do what? But, now see, we all know that, right? Sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, I want you to look at Job 19 and verse 2. You know, that sounds good. But it's just not true. Because the Bible tells us something entirely different. And the Bible is what? Truth. In Job 19 and verse 2, it's recorded, How long will you torment my soul and break me in pieces 
with words. Words hurt. And it doesn't have to be just malicious sometimes. Just the word in the wrong spot. And sometimes when people not understanding what's going on with someone else will say something that hurts really bad. So we need to control our tongue. And we need to think about the things we say. Because a small fire becomes a forest fire. And the tongue is a fire and it will spread fire. And the words that it spreads are hurtful. I want us to think about that. But go back to our text and look at verse 6. And verse 6 says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Well, when you come to verse 6, you go to the next point. The tongue is out of control, and here's what kind of tongue we actually have. It is a filthy tongue. Preacher, I don't cuss. Sometimes cussing might would be better than what we say about people without using a curse word. Our tongue defiles, which means that word defiled means dirty. You can get a picture of it in Mark chapter 7, and we want to see that as well, because I want you to truly understand how bad the tongue is. In Mark chapter 7, and looking at verses 20, and then at verse 23, we see this. And he, being Jesus, said, What comes out of a man, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. Jump to verse 23. And all these evil things come from within and defile a man. In other words, our tongue, what defiles a man, comes from, out, comes from inside out. And the only place it can come out is through our mouth. And so what Jesus is saying, the things that are on the inside of us is what controls our tongue and it defiles us so, so often, so many times when we speak horrible things about people or we spread gossip and rumors about people or we, say, we have just hurtful things to say about people, it defiles us. There is a word that means... Blemish. We call it mar. We mar people or we blemish people. And that is the filth that we spread. And that filth that we spread brings trouble. Go back to Psalms 55. What kind of trouble would it bring? Well, the psalmist writes in Psalms 55, and I had it marked, so it should take me but a minute to get there. In Psalms 55, verse 21. He says, the words of his mouth were smoother than butter. Y'all ever met somebody like that? Man, they are smooth-talking people. And their words are just smooth. They just roll out, and you're listening, and you're thinking, boy, that's good stuff. And then when he walks off, you begin to think, what did he say to me? Notice this. But war was in his heart. His words were smooth, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Surely that's not a Christian's voice. Surely that's not how Christians do things. We mislead people because our voice is like butter and oil and smooth. and It, it just kind of smooths things over. But all the time in our hearts we're thinking about how we can destroy someone or how we can beat someone out of something or how we don't really like that person, so we're still talking and trying to be smooth, but we just want to get away from that person because we don't like that person. And if that be the case, then we've broken the, one of the great commandments, which is to love our fellow man. And if we broke the second commandment, which is to love our fellow man, guess what else we broke? The first commandment. Because on these two commandments hinge all of them. So now when you realize you broke the second, which means you broke the first, you have broken every single one of them. And Christians just can't do that. 
I think we tend to forget what Christians are supposed to do and how Christians are supposed to act. That brings me, not only do we have a tongue that's out of control and a filthy tongue, but now we come to another type of tongue found in verses 7 and 8, and that tongue is a savage tongue. Notice verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird or of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. So we look at it, animals can be trained. Some of you are cat people, right? Some of you love cats. Some of you have cats in your home. And you've tamed those cats. And, and they'll meow and you'll let them out the door. And, and they'll claw on the door and you'll let them back in. Some of you are dog people and you love these dogs. And you train the dogs to squirrel hunt. You've trained the dogs to rabbit hunt or to deer hunt. You've got dogs in your house. You let them in and out. And they, they're good dogs. And you let them lick in your face right after they've licked somewhere else. I don't really understand that. Some of you are horse people, and you put the saddle on the horse and the bridle on the horse, and you ride that horse. Some of you raise cows. I mean, there's just we have tamed and domesticated animals all over this world. We can tame animals. We know how to do it. We, we know how to treat a, a cat and a dog. That's verse 7. Then you come to verse 8. But no man. Isn't that amazing? I've gone to the circus and seen a guy lay down and have an elephant put his foot on a guy. Y'all, y'all, have y'all seen that? Elephant has put his foot on the chest but won't mash it down. I went to the rodeo a few years back and I watched a guy ride a buffalo. Have y'all ever seen the guy ride the buffalo? Come on. Nobody, I'm the only guy here seen a man ride a buffalo. He rode that buffalo around the ring. And when he got through, they backed the truck out in the middle of the ring, and he rode, rode that horse. This old Mississippi Coliseum, he rode that horse, that buffalo around, rode him up, and when the buffalo went into the trailer, he jumped up and landed on top of the trailer. The guy did. I mean, we can tame anything. But verse 7 says there's one thing that man cannot tame, and it is our tongue. That's sad. You can make elephants pull trees, pull logs. They do it over in India and in Indonesia. They, they can hook oxen to, to plows and mules to plows. And they can make dogs pull sleds and horses pull carriages. And, but no man, according to verse 7 or 8, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil. Boy, I like that word, unruly. Full of deadly poison. You know what this is telling us? Man must change. But man cannot change. Man must change the way he controls his tongue, but man cannot do it. And so here is James, and he's writing, and he says, this tongue is a terrible thing. You need to show me your works. If you've got faith, you remember you go back to the first chapter. You need to be doers of the word. You need to work. You need to have faith. You need to be changed. How are you going to be doers of the word? Control your tongue, but you can't control it. So let Christ have His way in your life. We have an uncontrolled tongue, a filthy tongue, and a savage tongue that cannot be controlled. And that savage tongue is also an unstable tongue. Look at verses 9 and 10. With it we bless our God and Father. And with it we curse men. Is that not unstable? I thought, man, how could James write something like that? We'll come to church on Sunday morning and we'll sing praises to God. We'll pray to God. We'll teach Sunday school lessons. We'll talk about the Bible all day long on Sunday. We'll go home on Monday and we'll start with a filthy mouth and dirty jokes and lying and, and telling stories on people. And then we're just terrible. And that's exactly what it's talking about. All I had to do was lean back in my desk chair and think, how could James write that? And then think about the things that are going on in this world. And I began to realize that James knew exactly what he was writing about because he was inspired of God and he knew the nature of man. We're terrible people. So we have an unstable tongue. 
We bless God. We curse God. How can this be? And then we come to the last two verses. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same oak? When I was a kid, well, I got stories tonight. When I was a kid, we were coming back from Vicksburg, Mississippi. My grandmother and my granddaddy, uh, my oldest brother, myself, and we were riding in, I guess, must have been what was a 57 Chevy car. And we got uh, halfway between, and the, if you know anything about number three, which you probably don't, but if you did, you would know that the hills meet the delta at number three highway. And out of, he pulled off on the side of the road, my granddaddy was driving, he got out with a bottle, and I was wondering where he was going, but he knew where there was a spring that was coming out of those hills to the delta. And he would fill up that, it was a Coke bottle, he filled it up, and that water was clear and cool, and he brought it, and my grandmother drank it, he filled it up, my brother, then me, then him, we got in the car and we went on. And that was good, clear water. But you know, I'm going to tell you something. If he'd have brought that first bottle of water back and it had been full of mud, I wouldn't have, I, he, he wouldn't have had to made a trip for me. It was a wonder, as Susan would tell you, it's a wonder I'd drink after my grandmother, wasn't it? I don't drink, I have a phobia. If you drank out of my coffee cup, we threw. Okay? But every time you'd go by and you stop at that spring, every time we'd make that trip, my grandmother had cancer way back then, and every time you'd go down that road and you stop, we'd stop there. That water that was coming out was always cool and clear. I was, I was a young guy, but it stuck with me. There's no salt water coming out of there. There was no oil coming out of there. There, there was no mud coming out of there. It was clear, cool water. You can't get salt water and clear, cool water out of the same spring. So out of your mouth, you're either going to have good or you're going to have evil. Because the people that were talked about that were blessing God on the Sabbath, cursing man the rest of the week, what was really coming out of them on the Sabbath was false. It was covered up. It was something they were trying to fool God with, and they could not fool God. If you're one of these people that come on Sunday and you bless God, but on Monday you hate your fellow man, the truth of the matter is on Sunday you hate your fellow man and you also hate God. You're not fooling God. You could not fool James, and you cannot fool God. You will never fool God because He knows every imagination of the heart. So that's a perfect illustration as to what James is trying to tell us. Then we go to verse 12, and, and then we're going to close. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring can yield both salt water and fresh. Just can't do it. How many of y'all have fig trees? Y'all like fig trees? And we have big ones back home. Huge fig trees. Uh, figs just everywhere. I mean, my daddy had five or six huge fig trees. And every time I was a kid and I'd go out there, the only thing I'd find on that fig tree, Miss Melanie, was a fig. That cherry tree that we, got, we made the wine from, every time we shake that tree, not one fig fell out of it. Because in a cherry tree, there's cherries. And in a fig tree, there's figs. And in a spring that has good water, there is good water. You don't cross the line. So what's the point, preacher? If you're a Christian, what comes out of you will be the things of God. If you're a Christian, your voice and the things that you say will reflect the character that you have, which is the character of God. So if you have anything else than the character of God coming out of you, there is a problem. And if you have it just on Sunday and the other six days of the week, you have that false character, you're false. One day Christians don't make it to heaven. Seven day Christians make it to heaven. And so James is right on target. 
And I want to back him up with Peter, so go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to conclude. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. 4. He who would love life and see good days, let him reframe his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile or deceit. That's pretty simple, isn't it? You want to be counted as a child of God? Do what's right with your voice. Do what's right with your life. Let people know that you belong to God, and, and you belong to God. Just because you say you belong to God doesn't mean that you belong to God. There has to be the lifestyle that goes with it. So who do you belong to? Think about that this week, and let it guide and direct you till we come back Wednesday night. Amen? Let's stand. One of our new members, uh, that'd be Stephen Ratcliffe. Would you dismiss us tonight, please?